Boa tarde. Primeiramente, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos. É uma honra muito grande para toda a organização da Semana da Geologia ter o auditório cheio e, enfim, ter a participação de vocês é algo de, que, que nos honra muito, né? nos deixa muito honrados. Bom, por probleminhas técnicos, aquele slide que a gente tem visto aí agora não vai ser apresentado, mas vamos relembrar que o tema da Semana da Geologia ele faz referência ao importante trabalho é, do John Dor, né? Jack Dor, é, que foi entregue em 1969. Bom, é, gostaria de ressaltar que na plateia temos algumas pessoas importantes, como o professor Eduardo Ladeira, a Cat Dor também, que é a filha do Dor. Muito obrigado pela sua presença. É, bom, e lembrar também que esse evento só é possível graças aos nossos patrocinadores. E eu gostaria de fazer referência à BNA Mine Solutions, à Datamine, à Amarillo Gold, à Anglo Gold Achante, ao Jazida, à SBG e ao Singel. É, graças a esses patrocinadores, um evento desse nível é possível. Nós somos verdadeiramente gratos a isso. Além disso, temos o apoio do USGS, da CPRM, o Marcelo Marinho está aqui também, obrigado pela presença da CPRM, é, a BMGEL, o CDTN, o IGC e ao UFMG Student Chapter, que são instituições que nos apoiam também. Somos muito gratos a esse apoio. Bom, a nossa palestra de encerramento e também palestra magna é será proferida agora pelo Chuck, que não é Chuck, né? é Chuck. É... Bom, o Chuck ele é doutor em Geologia Metamórfica e Estrutural pela University of Washington, em 1962. Chuck, come... Chuck começou sua carreira profissional uh, com a Humble Oil, da Exxon, entre 1962 e 1965, como geólogo estruturalista na província Basin Range, do oeste dos Estados Unidos, e a, base... e a bacia é, Ad... Admore Andarco, no Oklahoma. Lecionou na Olympic Community College e na Universidade de Oregon, em 1900 e, entre 1965 e 1971. Durante esse tempo, foi consultor para empresas de petróleo e mineração na província Basin Range. Em 1971, Chuck se juntou à USGS em serviço estrangeiro na Libéria, de 1971 a 1972, e no Brasil entre 1972 e 1974. O Brasil se tornou o seu país estrangeiro favorito, do, Arizona, do Amazonas a Ipanema. Ao retornar aos Estados Unidos, Chuck trabalhou como geólogo estruturalista nos estados ocidentais do país entre 1974 e 1995, com um pequeno intervalo como chefe do Centro de Recursos Minerais de 1981 a 1986. Em 1995, Chuck se aposentou pela USGS, mas ainda possui o título de geólogo emérito até hoje. Depois de se aposentar, Chuck liderou com sucesso um programa de exploração de ouro no Pará, foi consultor no Brasil e nos Estados Unidos, e continua realizando estudos tectônicos regionais na região de Basin Range e luta contra moinhos de ventos geológicos. Que referência, hein? Uh, bom, então vamos à palestra The Legacy of the Quadrilateral Ferrífero Project. Welcome to Geology Week, Chuck. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. First thing you have to understand, my grandchildren say I am technologically challenged. So if something goes wrong here, it's almost always my fault. Now, which reminds me, this is an honor for me to come back. I lived here, I've been back, I've been back to Brazil from the United States since 1974 close to maybe 30, 35 times. Ran an exploration program in Pará for a while, had a wonderful time, and then I quit because we had a, a couple of crooks on our board 
in our company, and that is bad news when it comes to your money going down the drain. And it happened. Now, first things first, where's Jefferson? There's Jefferson. Okay. Now, would Jefferson's committee all stand, please? Everybody on the committee for this program, stand. Come on, there's more than that. Come on, come on, come on. This is fantastic. I think we need, deserve that. They deserve a big round of applause. Okay, you can sit down and go back to sleep now. But really, I've, I've been to a lot of programs, technical meetings, et cetera, and this is one of the best organized meetings that I've ever seen. And what's really nice, I have to say this very strongly, when I graduated from undergraduate in 1954, before most of you, your parents may be alive, I don't know, the, there were very few women in the geological sciences. And one of my favorite ladies, when I was an undergrad student, wanted to be a geologist. She was almost a genius, spectacular. But she went into economics because our professor told her that she would not be able to do field work in the mining companies and with the oil companies. And she would probably be a micropaleontologist. So she quit geology. That's terrible. When I arrived here in, in January, or December 18, 1972, the next two weeks with CPR Emmy, there were only a few ladies in the geosciences in, that, in the company. Now it's completely different, and I think it is fantastic. So congratulations to the men for stepping out of the way and learning that these women are smarter than most of you guys. And if you don't believe it, try it. So anyway, before I, before I get going, you've heard a lot about fake news in the United States. That is fake news. OK, you understand, huh? If a dead person is talking to you, you, you are not alive. Okay, a field trip that had with Eduardo Ledeta, we were running a, 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 a short course here. I love field trips in Brazil, but some in Brazil, but sometimes they get a little out of hand. For those of you who might know him, this is uh, Professor Hardy Jost. Uh, he's a very, very good friend, but sometimes I don't think he understands what's happening. Because it looks like he's trying to push the bus over, not up. <laughs> now, this, this is something you will see in a mine. If you ever go, start going into mines, pay attention to these. This is critical. This is critical. Or in Portuguese, let's go. Here, go. That's serious business, and that's no kidding. Now, here is a picture from quite a while ago. Kathy, when was that, about 19, 1950, more or less? This is John Doerr. Now, you remember one thing. John Doerr was the manager of the program. And he was a very good manager. And that's why he's not driving. <laughs> so when you go in the field with somebody and say, oh, you're going to be the driver, hang tight, because you don't know what's going to happen. Ah, back one. Eduardo Ledeta. And me, 1986, Mojo Velho. 
Now, Eduardo is a good person to have in a mind with you. What happened? You need somebody to hold it up so that it doesn't come down on you. He was very nice. He, he let all of us go past him before the, the ceiling came down. And in this outcrop, he's washing his hands of anything that happened or has been said. It's somebody else's problem. A group of very wonderful people, Eduardo Ledeta, Ronald Fleischer, Atahualpa, uh, Diogenes Vial, the Paulo Roberto Amorin. They were in this class. This is at uh, uh, Passaggio de Mariana, 1986. And this, this is Ronald Fleischer giving a Sermon on the Mount. He, I think he thought he was a Cristo at one time here. But anyway, some people here, uh, oops, we lost that one. Eduardo Ledeta, Wirtz, uh, Paulo Marine, and half of this guy is, Carlo, uh, is Carl Anhauser from uh, South Africa. Now, to our business of the legacy of the Quadrilateral for Hifferu. If you're expecting a lot of scientific spewing out from me, you're in for a, a, a big surprise, because you're not going to hear a lot of geology from me. You heard so much this week. I'm completely out of contact with a lot of what's been happening in the Quadrilateral. So if I say anything, I would be in deep trouble immediately. In 1945, in Washington, D.C., John Doerr with the USGS and some other survey people and people from, from uh, DNA and PME got together to come up with this idea of the Quadrilateral for Hifuru project. And the thing is, why? Why would you want to do that? Well, the, the legacy that I'm going to give you is what, what this project has passed down to you. A legacy is something that somebody gives to you. And hopefully it's a good one, because if your uncle died hanging from a tree, that's a legacy you don't want. Now, Dor and, and the DNA PME people sat down in early 1946, and they signed an agreement at what they were going to do. Make a map and geology of the entire quadrilateral for Hifru most of which had not been mapped. Now, in 1910, Derby, geologist with USGS, was at the International uh, Geology Congress in Stockholm, Sweden. And he brought the, the world attention of Brazil's iron deposits. From 1910 to 1945, there were only a few reports of geology done. They were done at different scales, different quality, poor base maps, things you could, would have had a hard time putting together. So what they did was they came up and said, oh, we need a set of maps for the entire quadrilateral. So DNA PME and the USGS contracted with Brazilian companies. They flew a complete aerial survey of the quadrilateral and made brand new topographic maps at a scale of 1 to 25,000 with a 10-foot contour, 10-meter uh, contour interval. That was a heck of an undertaking, but if you want to do something right, you better have a good base map, because it's very hard to pass it on to other people. Now, th th this says I'm an emeritus, but what the heck does an emeritus mean? Well, with the USGS, we have over 500 emeritus, emeriti. An emeritus is a person who works without getting paid. It's, it's really a good deal. But I retired in 1995, and I told my wife I was thinking of getting an emeritus position. So she, she came over to the survey to help me get some of my things out, and she said, oh my god. They better give you an office because you're not bringing all this junk home. 
And that's the good part about being in Mars. Most of your rocks and books and whatnot could be left at the survey. That was a blessing. The next thing is, you get to work with a lot of people who are still doing geology. And you can keep up with what's going on. And you get a chance to mentor with the young people like you. One of the big, biggest problems is what we call institutional memory. When somebody who knows a lot of stuff about deposits or about a company, when they disappear, you can't walk down the hall and talk to them anymore. That knowledge is lost. And the nice thing about the emeritus program is a lot of us are still around. But one thing about geologists, you know, they're not dead. They just kind of smell that way. OK, now, what, why did they form the, the, this program, program for this? After World War II, there was a tremendous shortage of readily available iron ore deposits. World War II had soaked up a tremendous amount of the iron deposits in the free world. So Dorr and some other people and the uh, DNA panda people knew, look, we've got this iron quadrangle area. So they came with this program to develop a geologic study of the entire quadrangle to understand the regional tectonic setting and sedimentary setting of these iron deposits. And then the other part of this is to do in-depth studies of these iron deposits. So you had a regional setting and a small scale setting. Now in, in geologic mapping, if you're gonna map a quadrangle or two, you can't spend a lot of time working one small area. You've gotta move around. So you need somebody who can do what I would say, postage stamp mapping. And then another person maps the entire envelope. Maybe you've got two, two field seasons to do the envelope. This guy spends two years just in this postage stamp understanding the small details. When you get through, you have something to work with. Now, one of the things that Brenna was showing earlier is perfect. The discovery of that deposit, a pair of boots and a hammer and somebody who recognized what these rocks look like. You didn't have a magical Google Earth terrain to look at. You didn't have GPS, all this stuff. They found out, picked up this rock and said, my God, what is this? This is not limestone. This is not tar karst topography. It took geologists to understand what the heck was going on. And they were off and running. And they didn't know what they had been, oh, taken a bite of. It was huge. But it's basic geology. Almost all discoveries are based on field work and understanding what you're doing. We'll, we'll talk about some of these new tools in a, in a minute. Now, the, the quadrilateral for HIFRU. What are we going to do with this thing? Well, this diagram shows you 19 geologists that worked on the, on the quadrilateral for HIFRU. There were three Brazilian geologists. And a couple of these guys, Alves and, and Barbosa, look, from 1947 to, to 1964, these guys are crazy. They spent that long working on there, but they were doing it half time. They had other jobs too. But this was a major, major project for, for DOOR to, and DNEPMA to do. How do you find the people to do this project? If you go and say, look, we're going to map 40 some seven and a half minute quadrangles. And they say, and who's going to do it? Well, Dorr had to sit down in the US, look over the entire US Geological Survey. Who, who is out there, has certain skills, and also is not afraid of leaving the country. There are a couple of factors involved in this. First, you had to find somebody with a set of skills that you need. Somebody that understands iron deposits, somebody that understands structural geology, 
somebody's not afraid to work. Because in field work, one of the most important things is a pair of boots and a strong legs. And if you don't have those, don't come to the party. Because it's going to be a long day. And you want boots, as Professor Ledator said, that does not have nails coming through them. That, that makes for a long day. So anyway, anyway, Dorr sat down, and he had to put a schedule together. He found 13 or 14 USGS geologists to come back here, come down to Brazil for anywhere from two to six years. And I know, I know four of those people. I worked with them. And they said that their eyes kind of glazed over when they were told what they, were gonna, what they would be doing and where. And then they were told, well, you know, probably better, you're going to want to take your family down because I don't think you want to leave them behind. <clears throat> well, now that's a shocker right there. And then you go home and you find out, oh, kids, we're moving to Brazil for two to six years. So now you're taking your children out of a comfortable setting where they've been growing up, <clears throat> and they come down here. They came down and went to American school. They picked up Portuguese. They, they had a ball. They got absorbed into the Minas culture. They thought it was a fantastic life. I've talked with several of the children of the geologists and the, fa the wives and whatnot, and they all, one thing to say, Brazil was a fantastic experience, and we'd go back, we'd go back at the drop, drop of a hat. We had a great time. The Brazilians were fantastic. We didn't understand the geology too well sometimes. But, you know, we were the first ones there. It was a cutting edge for an awful lot of that. And a lesson. When you're the second person or the third person to come in and look at a map, don't be too damn critical. Because let me tell you, wipe your memory bank. You know nothing. You don't have a GPS. You don't have anything. You got a pair of boots, a hammer, and a canteen, and off you go. Nobody's been there before you. And you've got to make this map. I've been there. I did this on my PhD thesis. I was scared to death. I, my professor came out to visit me in the field a couple of times, and I sweated bullets when he was telling me, you know, hey, we're going to go look at this, we're going to go look at that. And I thought, oh, God, here we go. I said, you know, this is three years wasted. But, but when I got through, it wasn't so bad. It was a great experience, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. No way, no way. Once, once is enough, once is enough. But anyway, anyway, you look at this, the scheduling. Most people were here, Phil Guile and, and, and Jack Dorr were the first people on board here. Not, not till 1950, did 51, did people start showing up. Well, you don't pull these guys off of a domestic program and make their boss happy. Because let me tell you, I've been in both positions. I've been the head of a group, and I've been in the group. And trying to pull people out of there is not a very pleasant th thing to do. Uh, among other things, they can tell you where to go. And it, they, don't, they don't say it in very nice language either. Now, when, when you get through all this, door total up somewhere, somewhere in excess of 100 man years of work for this. Well, I was head of the minerals department for the USGS in central United States. I had some, almost 90 some professional geologists and a total crew of almost 150 people. And I know that this, it took in more than 100 man years. All the people that edit the reports, go through and make the maps, all of this stuff. When I did it, I estimated $125,000 per year per scientist. And I ran a budget somewhere around $7 million a year. Now, with, with this thing, in today's dollars, U.S. dollars, I would put this over a quarter of a billion dollars. That, that's a lot of money. One of the things he had to do, he had to find places for these people to live. They had to come down, make their families happy. <clears throat> and that's not always easy in a foreign country. It's bad enough at home. 
But so there, there, there were a lot of things that Dorr had to do that people don't have no comprehension of what it was like to be running this big, big program. So what did they leave behind? The legacy they left behind is two things. How to put together a major program. You design what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? After you figure that out, okay, now how are we going to do it? Where are we going to find the people? How are we going to do this? Where are we going to find the money? This is a huge game. This is a huge game that they, they came down here and took on. I've been, I've been this route, only I didn't have the problems that they did, and it was still tough. So anyway, they gave you the legacy of how to put together a scientific program in the proper manner. The second thing they did that you see is the geology. These guys were all over the countryside, and I've talked to them, and they said, God, you know, I hope nobody ever goes over in this part of my map. Or hope nobody, you know, it was brutal. Access to there was not good. They had mules, horses to get around. The roads weren't very good for those that were there. And this was rough country. And I was in some of it in the 70s, 73, 74. And I said, God, don't put me in here. It's terrible. But they, they gave you a set of maps that are extremely reliable. There are lots of mistakes in them. But remember one thing, nobody has made a perfect map. Somewhere along the line, a map can be improved on. And if you're afraid of making mistakes, don't ever take up mapping, because you will make mistakes without question. That's the name of the game. Now, this is important. When you're writing a report, like they did, there was nobody to rely on for the most part. But today, you guys have a huge bibliography of things. Your cell phone, my God, iPad, my God, you can pick up all kinds of stuff. But make sure you look at something before 2000. Just because you can't find it on your iPad or your cell phone, there's a lot of information back there. And if you don't dig in, when I read a report for a journal to edit or something, one of the first things I do is look down the references cited. If there's nothing older than 2005, 2009, I know this guy's blowing smoke. This is crazy. There isn't an area in the world, Harley, where you can't find references that predate before you were born. And that's important. So research, steal one an idea from one person is plagiarism. This is, this is the game you're playing. But don't forget to cite re the reference. Tell people where you got this idea. Because otherwise, you are a thief. And in my game, where I work in the Western United States, we know who they are. And we don't associate them with them. We just don't have anything to do with them. Because it's almost impossible to come up with a completely new idea. I hate, I hate air conditioning. It dries my throat out something terrible. Okay, here's something that you will see time after time in well-written papers. Read that through. That is critical. That was written 66 years ago by Phil Guile on his report on the Cogonius area. Now, he was being as honest as you can ever be. I've looked at it. I don't understand everything. But here's what I think, and you better work a little bit harder if you're coming after me, because I know you can find things and you can modify it, or you might completely change the idea. 
But here's what we know when we wrote this report and when we made this map. That's honesty. Now, another one. You know what obsolescent means. It ain't good no more. Fifty years ago, you know who that's got to be? That was Don Doerr in his paper on the quadrilateral. Again, extremely honest in telling you what he's done. And if you can't find something to improve on, you haven't worked very hard. This is all, what I could do with what I've got. He had 40-some quadrangles to match together and make them work. And let me tell you, there are a lot of places where what we call quadrangle boundary faults occur. The units come together like this. Yep. You say, were these people looking at the same rocks? How can that be? But he had to make sure everything came together all the way across. I've done this. I did this on a map of Liberia a number of years ago. And I only had like 15 maps to work on. And one map would have a million faults all over the place. And another one, hardly any. And they come against each other. And you say, okay, this guy was drinking that night. This guy, this guy was in the sun too long, et cetera. You, know, it, it, you wonder, how, do they, how, this go, how can two people have such different ideas sometimes? The best expression I heard from one of my very good friends was he said, the fault pattern on here looks like ice melting on a river, just falling apart, ice flows. He said, this is crazy. Well, we had to fit it into the overall map. And that was a talent that Jack Doerr had that was fantastic. That's not an easy project. OK, the quadrangles. Those are the ones that were mapped. George, George Simmons, Alves, Pomeranian, Phil Guile down in Congonias, Bob Wallace, Jack Gare, Alves again, O'Rourke, Dor and Barbosa. Just Barbosa. I think Dor got tired of working down there. Actually, he had so darn much going on trying to keep the place going. It was all he, I, I'm amazed he had as much time in the field as he did. Because running that many people, you heard the expression, it's like herding cats. It's the very same thing trying to oversee geologists. They are in, you should be independently mined, but not so much that you can't work with somebody else. Charles Maxwell. Sam Moore, George Simmons again, and this guy, I've never been able to find his, his uh, bio. It's something called reconnaissance. And then uh, Bob Reeves, and then up at Itabira, Doran Barbosa again. But you look at what some of these people did. Bob Wallace had four quadrangles. George Simmons had three here and one and a half up here. It depends upon how long they were in the country, Etc. How long could you keep this piece? You know, you had to lure or bribe or hijack these people to get them down here, to get that many people. It's not easy. It's not an easy project to do. But, but John Doerr did this, and it's, it's, my hat is off to him. Now, let's look at the geologic map of the Cordillera. going to talk about a little bit of geology here and some, some philosophy. R right down in here, the geologic, uh, uh, this, this is the uh, uh, Moreno de Serra quadrangle, mapped by uh, Bob Wallace. And I know Bob Wallace. I knew him very, very well. I shared an office with him for 14 months in Liberia. And that was an ordeal. He's different. He came one day and he said, you know, Chuck, he said, Plate tectonics, continental drift, that stuff, that's all a bunch of garbage. I looked at him and I said, what? What are you talking about? He says, there's no way Brazil 
and West Africa were ever connected. It's impossible. I said, okay, come on, now what, what, what gives? He says, well, look, the coffee here in, Brazil, in, in, in Liberia, West Africa, is the worst I've ever had. And Liberia ha and, and Brazil has the best coffee in the world. They cannot have ever been connected. This is crazy. Well, he, he had a certain line of reasoning to think about. But that's, that's the way Bob thought at times, too. Uh, but anyway, we had, a, we had a ball working together, but it was, every day was another event. Okay, what we're going to look at is this area right here and a little close-up. Now, see this little white dash thing? This is the road to, to Moeda going down here. This yellow line right here is uh, 40, uh, uh, Highway 40, okay? Now, when I first arrived in Brazil, my job was to teach a photogeology class, interpretation of photogeology and geologic ma and, and topographic maps. I had a group of 20 geologists from CPRM and uh, a couple from Canaan. We had a ball. I didn't speak a word of Portuguese. The USGS sent me down here without a, spending one damn cent on language. So I had to travel down to the U.S. consulate on Avenida, uh, uh, what the hell, I can't remember now, D downtown every day in a taxi to spend an hour down there. And it was great. One of my teachers was a cousin of Carmen Miranda. It was very interesting. <coughs> but anyway, the object of photogeology is not necessarily to make maps, but to understand where you're going and where is the best place to go where the geology may be the simplest and you can get a good foothold to understand what you're going to be running into. You don't want to jump in the middle of the worst place. Heaven forbid you'll, you'll go nuts. You'll go nuts. When you find a complex area, get out of there. Circle it. Go all the way around it and map the simpler geology first and then come into it. And you may find out it's not wasn't worth your time to spend very much time in it after all. It's really relatively simple. But if you start in the most complex area, you're wasting your time and your company's time. So anyway, we, had, we spent a week, uh, four weeks doing this. And then the next two weeks, I had aerial photography for the entire quadrilateral. I took the group and divided it into four groups, so five each. And then I took the quadrilateral and divided it into four parts. Each group had one of those sections to make a, fo a photogeologic map of, and then pick the be best places to go to understand what you're going to be encountering. Learn the stratigraphy, maybe a little structure, but try the, the simplest place first. Well, so we, we came up to Bellow. And that was fantastic. For me to walk out and see the quadrilateral was absolutely, it was mind-blowing for me. I couldn't believe it. So I, because I'd worked in the, in, in, in the African uh, jungle. And I thought, my God, this will be great. And then I see all this bloody laterite. Holy God, where are the fresh rocks? So anyway, we went out, and the first group picked this area right here. They were group number one. And number one said, oh, we're going to walk along this road right in through here and see, see these units, because you can see it. The topography shows this very nice layered geology. I said, OK, sounds good. So we started up in here, and we walked down through and down to this point right here. And when we got down there, I said, OK. Tell me what we've been seeing. And they could describe the lithologies. They could do this very well. And I said, now, what about where you thought you had a contact? He said, God, they're coming out real close to what, what uh, uh, Bob Wallace has on here. I said, great. I said, now, look, we're, we're right here now. What do, we, what do we see here now? Well, we've walked across this intrusive contact, and we're now on the basement. 
and I walked a little bit farther down there and turned around so they wouldn't see me, and I just about had a heart attack. I couldn't believe what they were doing. One of the geologists, a Canaan geologist, was a senior by 10 or more years of these young people. Most of them have been, only been out of college for a couple of years. And I said, so describe what we've got here. Well, we, there's the intrusive contact, and here we're looking. I said, we've heard that. Now, what else? Well, this Canadian geologist way in the back, he says, oh, he raised his hand real quiet. I said, Doctor, that's all right. I said, speak, speak up. What do you want to say? He said, I got a question. I said, I've already asked the question. You're supposed to give me the answer. And he said, well, I've got a question. I said, okay, what? These look kind of like they might be myelinites. So I said, okay, the rest of you, what do you think? Well, they might be, but this is the intrusive contact. I said, okay. Mr. Kinane, why do you say it's my, well, if it's a myelinite, what kind of a contact is this? He said, well, I guess it should be a fault. I said, no kidding. Myelinite along a fault? What a novel idea. People look at me, and I said, they don't look like myelinites at all. I said, they are myelinites. You guys, use your eyes. God gave you a brain, well, whatever, whatever you have up there, and some eyes. What do you see? Get down on your hands and knees and walk and crawl around here and look at this. I said, oh, God, yes, these rocks are sheared. I said, yeah. So what are you going to call this contact now? So, Uh-oh. Well, the USGS, I said, I didn't ask you that. I said, what do you call the contact? Well, maybe it's a fault. I said, not maybe. It is a fault. But Wallace shows us, I said, lesson number one in geology. Use your eyes and think. Now, in, ge in geologic mapping, you've got two things you have to do. One, one you have to come up with well-defined units to map. And you have to learn how to place the contacts between them very, very accurately. Geologic mapping is observation and then interpretation. You don't start interpreting something until you've seen it. You look at it from a distance. You think about it. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Let's go look at it and really observe what you've got. So what do we see here? Well, the contact. I said, is the contact in the right place? They said, oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a good map because the units they describe are where they show them. The contacts are good. This is not interpretation. This is observation. Now, the kind of contact you put down is interpretation. Is it a fault? Is it intrusive? Is it sedimentary contact? What is it? That's the interpretation part. And the great thing that you have out of these geologic maps that they made is the description of the arc units are pretty darn good, and the location of the contacts between them is pretty good. And you look around. Are there lots of strikes and dips on the map? Foliation symbols, et cetera, et cetera. This tells you, first of all, how much ground the author has covered. If you don't see much of that on there, this person wasn't working very hard. So that is the observation part. And everything you observe, you put on a map. It's easy to take it off later if it's too crowded. But it's better to have to be able to take it off than to try to figure out what you're going to put there. So this is what we came up against. The contact was exactly in the right place. But the interpretation by what we saw there was wrong. So I said, OK, that sounds pretty neat. If, if this is a fault right here, what is it all along here? <clears throat> Up, up north and south of this. So we spent the rest of the afternoon driving north and south, 
going on each of these roads that would cut across and every place where we could find a decent outcrop, it had myelinite. Now, in the day, of, in the 50s and 60s, when this work was being done, this was not an unusual interpretation to make, to make something like this as, as an intrusive contact. Well, you know, plate tectonics and things like that, nobody heard of it. GPS, what is that? What part of the alphabet did that come from? What language are you speaking? You know, it's a whole, it was a whole different world in the 50s and early 60s, making these maps. So when we got through, we had a completely different interpretation for this area. Is that bad or is that good? Well, it depends upon who you talk to. It depends on what their ideas are. That's the rock that I was sitting on right there. You can see the, the planar structure in there. Where it was, and I was sitting on there, you know, and my, my heart was just pounding. I said, my God, folks, please understand what we're looking at. Please, please, please. And if you, let me see. If, if you want to take the road to Moeda down there and take the map and go, you can go right there, and it's there. I ser seriously doubt that the rocks have changed. So we took this map, and then Eduardo Ledeta and I made this map for a short course that we did in 1986, a deposit modeling class. And this was in the in uh, USGS Bulletin 1980-A. It came out in 91. We were kind of slow getting it out. We have this diagram, and we've changed this contact like this as a fault contact between the supercrustal rocks and the basement. That wasn't hard to do. All we had to do was add these little, bar, little points on the map because the contact was perfect. There was nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. This guy knew exactly where he was and what he was doing as far as observation was concerned. Interpretation became another problem with him because I also worked on his maps in Liberia. His, every place he had a contact, there was something there. Never, never worried. Now, <coughs> this map, let me back up a minute here. When we ran this course in, in early 1973, Later in 1973, uh, we had several geologists from the USGS and from a couple of universities come down here to teach short courses for CPRME, DNEPME, and Canadian. One of the people we brought down was a man named Avery Drake from the Eastern United States, an excellent, excellent structural geologist. We had him and a guy named Vernon Hurst from the University of uh, Atlanta in Georgia, who was a specialist in laterites and i mean he was a specialist i thought he was sick he could pick up a dirty red rock <clears throat> he tells you what it came from <clears throat> he'd look at it he could give the mineralogy the, every, it, it was amazing and the first day in the field with it when we took this group that he that uh, drake and, and hearst were were going to teach one of the geologists told me he says i'm going to check him out see how good he really is i said okay so we drive down this highway, and he says, let's stop right here. There's a big, dirty red outcrop. And he says, okay, Dr. Hurst, what, what do these rocks look like? Oh, let me see. Look, He says, how about a granite diorite? I thought the guy was going to die. We get back in the car. We drove about a half a kilometer, made a big U-turn, went into a quarry. A granite diorite quarry, exactly what he had called it. Bingo. I thought this guy was magic, because I always just look at that stuff and kick it out of the way because I can't. See. It's in. It's just dirt. So anyway, when when uh, Drake and Hurst finished teaching that course in, uh, in 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 the central part of the country, I picked them up. I dropped Hurst at the airport in Brasilia and took Avery Drake with me. Drive over here because I wanted to show him these things because he likes this. Well, later, after showing him a couple of these things, I could see his mind going, 
you know, and I showed him three places. And he says, oh, it's very interesting, Chuck. See, he knows the difference between Shuki and Chuck. And he said, that's interesting. Okay. That was all he said. A year later, he came back down with another fellow, Benjamin Mo uh, Morgan, who used to be the chief geologist of the USGS. The two of them came down here to teach us a course in field geology. They ended up doing their field geology in the quadrilateral periphery. And from that came this. They said, basically, the basement is nowhere, for the most part, intrusive into the supercrustal rocks. I'll put the Portuguese up afterwards. Okay, next step. The cratonic rocks are overthrust by the Nova Lima group. Everything is a lock in us, including the ultramafic and you know, ophitic rocks. That was a very bold statement to make. Plate tectonics was just catching on. When I saw the eyes, the plate tectonics out. I had no idea what, what was going on at that time. Then the last statement is, the entire Nova Lima Alochthon is an early example of plate tectonics. So these guys came up with something, and I didn't. I, I had no idea what they were doing. They told me this several years later. I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, "Oh, Mylonites." He said, "They're pretty neat." Well, I showed them to you. I thought you'd like them. He says, "God, I loved them." And he said, "We got to see a lot more." Now, what this shows is a good geologic map. The contacts are in the right place. The rock units are identified correctly. In a relatively short time, Morgan and, and Drake and their field geology crew could go all, all over the quadrilateral and look at critical points. They didn't have to map everything. When they got there, the map showed them exactly what they thought they would see. They just had to reinterpret the contact. In the 50s and 60s, you show this to those people, and they'd think you're you know, you've been you've been out all night with uh, enjoying a few caipirinhas or something. You're, you're you're crazy. What the heck are you talking about? But this was a major advance, and this is what this is the legacy you've gotten from the quadrilateral peripheral project. A good set of maps. Sure, there are mistakes in them. But nobody's ever made a perfect map. But if you can go back and reinterpret very quickly. A contact based on a new idea, it makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. And here's what they loved. What they called egg carton structure. The domes are coming up like eggs. Not as uniform as this. I just picked this up out of the store last week, so, you know, uh, when I get home, I hope they're still good. But he, now, for them, here's an egg poking up. Here's another egg. Here's another egg. Maybe this one is a little bit of a ovus mishtu, maybe a little different. But that's okay. What they're saying is nice domes. If you understand and have seen these in other places, these nice domes just kind of pop up. And yet, if you look at this on a, uh, on, a, on a geological basis, oh, that's pretty doggone interesting. And this, whether, now here's what they had to say. And this is critical. When they're saying our reinterpretation is, is made in the same spirit, what they're saying is in their report just before this, they are quoting Jack Dorr about hope you can find some of this may be obsolescent. They were doing it in the same spirit. And we hope that the possibility, they're not saying it is. We're saying we hope 
the possibility will drive people to think a little bit more about other things. And that is what geology is all about. Sometimes you make mistakes, sometimes you don't. And at the beginning, you don't know which is a mistake and which isn't. Hopefully you find out or somebody else finds out before you publish the map, but that's, that's life. You're never going to publish a perfectly correct map. And don't, and here's a, here's a problem I'm, I, we run into a lot in the U.S. Geological Survey at other geological surveys around the world. People don't understand that they're getting paid to do this work so other people can see it. You're not going to spend 15 field seasons in one small area and then write a paper for three people. That's not the way it works. Geologic mapping, I went to visit one, one fellow that I, when I was head of the, my minerals group, I went to visit him up in Idaho to see what he was doing. He had been working in the same area almost 20 years. And he had a permanent place to park his trailer. This was home for him in the summer. But I was very fortunate because the person who was paying his salary from headquarters said, let Ben do whatever he wants in the summer. What he does in the winter, there's nobody in the world that can do this. He was an ore microscopist. Genesis of ore minerals. And people came from all over the world to take his course. So he was worth a lot of money. A lot of money. And he was one of the nicest people in the world. You go in and ask him something, and you better have a half an hour because he's going to start at the beginning. You ask him what time it is, and he starts at how a sundial works. You know, I mean, God Almighty, I don't have all day for this. But but that's the, what it, what he does. But th th spur the possibility. That's why we write reports. We can't we can't have the the complete answer every time. And if you think you've got the complete answer, you're in trouble. Thirty that was thirty nine years ago. So this stuff is very important. Now, a comment from a very very good friend of mine who's a Igneous geologist and ore, ore deposits geologist. We become tool focused. How many more gadgets can we buy for our laboratory to work with? And when you get all through, they are subordinate to critical thinking. And if you're not critical about what you're doing in the, in the field, you're not doing your, the right job. You want to think all the time. Put notes down. Put interpretations down in there. One of my friends at the USGS, his professor told him, you never put interpretations in your field notebook. I said, you're wasting half your time in the field then. That you have the observation, what the attitude, et cetera, are, and then you have an interpretation of what you think you saw there. Because next week, you may not remember which outcrop you saw that you got that idea. And next year, and the year after, make sure you do that. And on the left side is for diagrams. I draw cross sections, et cetera, on the left side of my notebook. And then across it, I put the field uh, observation point. I put it on there so I know exactly where everything was. That field notebook is worth it. It's irreplaceable, irreplaceable. So there, there it is. So, so now here, critical thinking. What are the modern tools for critical thinking? It's not a GPS. It's not a computer. It's not a laptop that you carry in the field. And a lupa. Caderno, huh? A boussole, a Brunton compass, or some kind of compass. Good boots, my God. If you don't have good boots, day is going to be like 58 hours. It's horrible. I got bought two pair of boots three years ago. 
thank goodness I took two of them with me because I stayed in a motel close to where I'm working. The first pair, man, I threw them in the trash, wore them one day, and I said, God, this is horrible. My feet hurt. I, you know, I couldn't care less what I did that night except sleep and soak my feet. A stereoscope, if you've got aerial photography, indispensable. Now, I don't, I don't use a stereoscope because I can, I can, do it like this. I can, I can see 3D with, without it. And I worked with a guy who could do it while he was driving, and I had the photos. He would look over like, he would look over, to, oh, and I, and all I could say is, you know, God, watch, the, uh, watch ahead. He says, oh, I see that, but you know what you're looking at is really pretty neat. I said, look out. He says, oh, don't worry, I won't hit that. It was a long day with, with him in the field. Samples. You can always throw them away, but you can't go back and get them easily. Your, your field notebook. And the last one, never leave the vehicle. <laughs> never leave the vehicle without that. It's a long day. And I guarantee you, you won't do it again. Okay, the last little bit. Think, thinking outside the box. Do you know how to think outside the box? Most people don't know how to think outside the box for one reason. They don't know they're in a box. And that is very concerning. Don't be afraid to think of a crazy idea. If you're in your field, don't worry. Nobody else can hear you. And I talk to myself a lot in the field for two reasons. One, boredom, and the other is there's nobody else smart enough to talk to. Okay, I'll give you a couple examples. A sample pit problem. You know, in Africa, they dig these things about, about like this, about so big around and about 8, 10 meters deep. How do you, sol how do you solve a problem in there? Well, this guy did. It's a miracle he's still alive. Another one, thinking outside the box. Here's a test. How would you trim a hedge that is too tall to reach on foot or on a ladder? Did you get that? How would you do it? you got to be a little creative. <laughs> well, you're thinking. The average person would say, God, I guess I'm going to have to hire somebody to get up there and do it. Well, he hired somebody, and he got up there and did it. But he, I don't want him working around my house. Okay, what else is there left? God, there can't be much. Okay, good. We're almost through here. Well, wait, we're not through. Just don't get too excited. Okay. Okay, well, th is, oh, yeah. thanks a lot for, for staying. And what I have to say one thing. I have never signed so many pieces of paper for young ladies since my, I've got five granddaughters, and when they want me to sign a check, that's when I see them. So thanks a lot. This is great.